Today is Vision Sunday, and I am excited to talk to you about the direction of what we're going and where we're headed as a church over the next year. I think most of us can associate the word vision with future events. You know, I mean, you know, just talking about the future. You know what I'm saying? When we're looking at, we're thinking of the future, we're thinking about what's coming up, what's happening in the future. But I think the vision has something that concerns tomorrow, but it, 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 it also concerns today. But vision, as the Bible describes it, encompasses a lot more than just the future. Proverbs 29 and 18 tells us that where there is no vision, the people perish. Well, we've heard that. The word vision in this passage of Scripture means divine guidance. We need divine guidance for today just as much as we need divine guidance for tomorrow. Can I get an amen? The Old Testament prophets didn't just deliver foresight about what was coming in the future. They also delivered insight as to what's happening today, right now, in the present. Vision for what God wants to do tomorrow always starts with discernment about what's happening today. Vision begins with supernatural insight into the specific struggles of our time. People with that kind of insight have always had extremely val been extremely valuable to the kingdom of God. First Chronicles chapter 12, David is stuck in a place called Ziklag. He's been anointed to be king, but he's being treated like a criminal. And I'm not sure what David thought this transition from shepherd to monarch was actually going to look like or how long he thought it was going to last. But I'm pretty sure that he did not expect for it to be 15 long years. And I'm sure that he didn't expect for 13 of those 15 years to be running for his life. In First Chronicle, Chronicles 12, it describes the days when things finally started to turn around for David. People began seeking him out by the thousands, defecting from Saul's army to join his. And the Bible says from day to day, men came to David to help him until there was a great army like the army of God. We're told exactly how many from each tribe came to join David in the wilderness. 7,100 from Simeon. 18,000 from Manasseh, 20,000 from Ephraim, 50,000 from Zebulun, 120,000 from Reuben and Gad, just to name a few. Men reported from all 12 tribes, and almost every tribe sent numbers in the thousands, except for one. From Issachar, men who understood the times, knew what Israel should do, 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Hmm. The men from Issachar. Issachar only sent 200 men and their families when other tribes sent as many as 120,000. At first glance, their contributions look pretty poor in comparison. But there is some wording here that lets us know that these men provided something of incredible value. See, David's army had a lot of soldiers, but very few strategists. There were a lot of people who were willing to do something, but they didn't know exactly what they were supposed to be doing. What, what was it that set these men of Issachar apart? If you can help me with the ring and the microphone, please. What was it that set these men apart? Was it the title or was it a position that they inherited? Not likely, given the description of their abilities. These men had a very rare and specific gifting. Everyone that came out into the wilderness, they took a huge risk in joining an underdog. They all saw that God's hand was on David's life and leadership. And they all possessed a desire to do something good. They've all possessed a desire to help out the man of God, the man that God has set in front of them. But they all did not possess discernment. While they had value as a fighting force, they did not have vision. Everybody say vision. 
What separated the men of Issachar was their understanding to see what should be done. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what kind of understanding they had, but probably because it was specific to just one particular subject. But these men understood their adversary and they knew what to do to defeat them. They understood the people and they knew what to do to motivate them. They understood the society and the politics of the day and how it shaped the current values and views. They understood the army's motives and they wanted to, that they wanted to serve God and the man that he placed in their authority. So what would the men of Issachar who had an understanding of the times and they knew the people and what they should do, what would they say to this generation, to us today? If they could step into 2022 and they could use that incredible gift of discernment, what would they see and what would they say? Obviously, there's no way to know for sure, but I can think of one present challenge and one future opportunity that might get their attention. The present challenge is this. People are being governed by uncertainty and fear instead of God. Before I get into what I'm referring to here, let me tell you what I am not referring to. I am not referring to taking precautions and living wisely. I, I, as you've seen throughout the pandemic, we have placed a premium on safety, the safety of this congregation. We've never hesitated to put policies in place to protect our congregation and we'll continue to do that in the future if necessary. But let's not forget that there's another part of this equation. After we've done all that we can do, we are told to stand and see the salvation of the Lord. We need to remember that we have a protector that is far more powerful than we are. We need to remember that he's the one that keeps us from moment to moment. We woke up this morning because it was his will that we live another day. We can walk, we can talk, we can work, we can worship because we are under his wing. Society has changed a lot over the last year and a half. Perspectives have changed, priorities have changed, and in some cases, values have even shifted. And, and much of this change has been driven by fear. The enemy is the, a master opportunist. He will quickly change his tactics to maximize whatever opportunities the current cultural climate gives him. We know that he's a tempter, we know that. He leads people into tent, uh, tend to sin. We can, when we think of temptation, we often revert to the sins of commission. We automatically think about the enemy leading people into doing things that are wrong. But the enemy can also tempt people into the sins of omission. He can lead people into not doing things that are right. And over the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of sins of omission. People stopping or slowing down on doing things that are right. And that's led to the sins of commission. See, there's a gap that's being filled when you're not doing something right that leaves a gap there. And there, any time there's a gap, the enemy will fill that gap. If, you're not, if you stop doing something you're supposed to do, we start to do some things we're not supposed to do. We can't live in this in-between. It's a lie to say that we can be neutral. See, less church absolutely leads to more sin. I'm gonna say it again. Less church leads to more sin. Less prayer absolutely leads to more problems. Less worship leads to more carnality. Less serving leads to more selfishness. Less giving leads to more greed. We cannot allow a gap to be there. The gap, this place in between of saying, I'm just, I'm taking a sabbatical, I'm taking a break. I'm just not gonna do as much as I used to do. If we're not doing what is right, it leaves this place of in between and that's neutral. Neutral is the enemy's playground. We can't, we can't have idle hands because your grandmother probably used to tell you what idle hands do. Idle hands, you know, an idle mind, that's, a, that's the devil's workshop. 
That's where he's doing his work. We have to keep doing what is right or we'll end up doing what is wrong. There's a strong pull right now towards less when it comes to spiritual things. Less expectation, less commitment, less effort, less excitement. The less, I want you to get this one. I hope you hear it. Listen, I'm going to say it clean. The less we do for God, the more we do for us. The more we do for us, the more we are like the one that's trying to destroy us. The less we do for God, the more we're doing stuff for us. And the more we do stuff for us, the more we are like the one that's trying to destroy us. I think the men of Issachar would remind us that while all experience fear from time to time, I'm not preaching against the fact that we get hit with fear from time to time. I'm preaching against living in fear. We all experience tear, fear from time to time, but the people of God are not to be governed by fear. We are called to live by faith. Somebody say faith. faith. I think that we sh it, they would remind us that God is still sovereign, that he created the heavens and the earth, that all power in earth belongs to him and everything that we, all the things that we do for him or all things work for the good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So can I just remind us today that COVID did not surprise God. It didn't knock him off of his throne. It didn't rob him of his power and authority. Are there some things that happened that, that maybe we don't understand? Absolutely. Are there some tough seasons and some tough losses that we've experienced? Absolutely. Should those things cause us to backtrack on our belief that he holds the world in his hands? Absolutely not. I still believe him when he said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I don't have to understand in order to trust. In fact, there are some things that I'm absolutely never going to understand, but I have to learn to trust him anyways. Isaiah chapter 26 and 3, it says this, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee trusting him brings peace what is peace according to the word the world's definition peace is happiness they're all looking for happiness but truthfully we know what they're looking for they're looking for peace and according to this trusting in God is what brings peace Trusting in his sovereignty brings peace. Trusting in his hand on our family, in our church family, it brings peace. But what erodes peace is believing, listen, is believing that your life is in your own hands and nobody is looking out for you except for you. That's what erodes peace. That everything in my life, if it has to be, it's up to me. It's only on me. It's only on my life. And if I'm going to take care, if anything good's going to happen, it's because I'm going to do it for me. And if anything's going to protect any, myself, or nobody else is going to protect me but me. For many people, what we've seen in the media, what we've seen in our community, what we've seen in our family, what we've experienced for ourselves has caused many people to stop trusting. God is not a man that he would lie. See, those people around you, they may have broken your trust. People in your life and people that you've been married to or related to or something on your job or whatever else, they've broken your trust. Man will fail you, but we serve a God that will never fail you. We serve a God that cannot fail. This is the same God that holds the world in his hand. And I want you to get a picture of the fact that God is holding the literal world in his hand. And as it rotates on a perfect axis, and as the, the moon rotates around the earth, and as the earth and the moon rotate around the sun, and as we float around this big galaxy called the Milky Way, and as the Milky Way floats around in a much larger spectrum called the Spironubia, and all of that and the millions and thousands and millions and planets are all through the there, God holds in his hand. 
That's the same God that rides beside you in your car on your way to work. And as that other car veers over into your lane and he bumps it over and he says, not today, devil. I'm not going to let it happen. I hold the world in my hand, but I also hold my children. I ask you to hear something I feel the Lord speak to me. See, I feel like he's telling some people here today, I felt this so strong yesterday. He's saying, you trust me with your salvation. You trust me that you come to this altar and that you repented of your sins and now you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and you've been baptized and you trust me with your salvation that you will spend eternity in heaven but you don't trust me with your healing. I've heard him say, I believe in my spirit, that these people here trust me with their salvation and the salvation of their children and that they will be able to spend eternity in heaven because I blotted out their sins and I've died for them. They trust me with that, but they don't trust me with their money. I'm preaching to you whether you're hearing it or not. It's difficult for me to imagine telling my wife I trust her and then not letting her have the password to our bank account. It's difficult for me to tell my wife that I trust her, but I won't let her have access to any of the money that we have in our home. Say this is no, 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 we don't get, no, 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 not the, not the wallet. We, get, we stay away from the wallet. Either I trust my wife or I don't. I'm preaching. Either we trust God or we don't. We trust him with our healing. We trust him with our money. We trust him with our kids. We must trust him. And if we don't have trust in him, we will never have peace. Mm. Where there is no trust, there is no peace. Where there is no trust, the people of God become weak and timid. The struggle with trust breeds trepidation. I think the men of Issachar would remind us that the Bible calls us to boldness. Everybody say boldness. boldness. I think the men of Issachar would remind us that we must be bold. And here's the definition of that word. Boldness is the courage to act or speak fearlessly despite real or imagined dangers. When a person acts boldly, he or she takes action regardless of risks. We're not called to be reckless, but we're absolutely called to be bold. Joshua 1 and 9 tells us, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's God speaking to you. 2 Corinthians tells us that since we have such a hope, we are very bold. 2 Timothy says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Deuteronomy tells us, be strong and be courageous, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Here's my favorite out of this group. Acts 4 and 13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. How did they know they were Christians? How did they know they walked with God? How did they know they were apostolic? How did they know they had been with Jesus? It's because they were bold, because they took steps of faith, because they didn't walk around with their head down, because they weren't fearful, because they said, I am a child of God. If you are bold, it's because you've been with Jesus. And if you've been with Jesus, you are bold. I'm going to say something. I hope you hear me good. It is impossible to walk in fear and walk with God. You cannot walk around in fear. You cannot walk around worried. You cannot walk around in trepidation and concern and, and dismay 
and walk with God. Someone that is eaten up with fear. I want to tell you, if you would get with God and you've been with Jesus, a boldness will come over that you haven't ever received before. You'll be able to do great things in him. Our spiritual heritage is full of bold men and women of God. We come from a people like Abraham that went up Mount Moriah even though they believed that it meant sacrifice and pain. We come from people like Esther that who went to see the king even though it could have cost her her life. We come from people like Moses who faced down his own fears and insecurities before facing down Pharaoh. We come from people like Joshua who invaded the promised land of armies that outmatched him. We come from people like Peter and Paul that didn't let difficult times stifle their calling to reach and disciple the lost. We come from people like Lewis Manuel, an amazing grandfather and man of God who went up and down the East Coast and the Midwest and even Hawaii building churches and winning souls. We come from people like Reverend C. E. Forbush who went to cities that no one else wanted to go to and was building thriving churches that are still growing 100 years later. We come from people like Pastor J.W. Forbush who brought his family to a city he'd never been to to reach a people he had never met to, to trust a God that has never failed him. We have a heritage of boldness. We are not a scared people. We're not a fearful people. We come from families. We come from a lineage of boldness. That's your apostolic heritage. No matter where you come from, no matter who your family is, your apostolic heritage is boldness. It's stepping out and doing what it seems like nobody else is going to do. When it's stepping out, when it seems like the risk may be too high, but it says, hey, boldness says that no matter what the risk, I'm stepping anyways. There's always an element of risk in every act of faith. Someone says, I, I only do it if it's necessary. <laughs> you know, I, I, if it's necessary, I do it. I mean, as long as it's, you just got to prove to me, I, I have to do it. I'm afraid the church has been influenced by the spirit of the world. And that spirit says that if it's necessary, I'll do it. If Sunday morning is necessary, I'll, I'll do it if I, if I have to. If giving my 10% tithes is necessary, then I'll do what's necessary. I think the men of Issachar would say this, you were called to be as bold as lions. And don't let the spirit of our age cause you to become lambs. See, the altar is still necessary be bold the prayer of faith is still necessary be bold baptisms are still necessary in Jesus name be bold the infilling of the Holy Ghost is still necessary be bold fellowship is still necessary be bold powerful moves of God are still necessary be bold Bible studies are still necessary be bold discipleship is still necessary be bold in person fellowship is still necessary be bold follow a shepherd is still necessary be bold financial sacrifice is necessary be bold somebody say be bold the vision for this year is based on no surprise here boldness I have several ways that we feel that we will step out in this year. Yes, sir. I'm going to share those with you. The first one is God is calling us to be bold in our invitations. There are people in our community that are hungry for what you and I have here today. Here's the problem. Some of them don't look like they're hungry. Some of them don't really look like it because they're not holding a sign up that says, I'm really hungry for what you have. Please come invite me to your church or invite me to a Bible study. I really want to know more about Jesus because they don't have that sign. That means that we have to take some risks. And remember that there's an element of risk in every act of faith. See, God is calling us to be bold, to start some conversations about faith with people who we are not 100% sure the conversation's gonna go well with. 
We are most effective, the most effective invitations begin as investments. Everybody say investments. We invest time into people. We develop relationships with them. We demonstrate the fact that we care to them and we serve them in whatever way we can. But when the time is right, we have to move from investing in them to inviting them. Invite them to a small group. Invite them to a Sunday service. Invite them to a home Bible study. Invite them to all three. Investments are where it starts, but that can't be where it stops. People need to hear the gospel. And for that to happen, the church is going to have to be bold. We will do that in 2022. We will be bold in our inviting. God is calling us to be bold in our volunteering. It can't always be about receiving. There's time for that. But ultimately, we take in in order to give out. We are saved in order to serve. There is a ministry here that cannot be all that it's supposed to be until you get involved in it. If all, listen, oh man, don't throw anything at me. Here we go. If all you do is attend the church, one day you won't. If all you do is come to church and receive, one day you won't. As much as we need you to be involved, you need to be involved even more so because it will help grow your faith and deepen, deepen your dedication to God. The next is God is calling us to be bold in our prayers. God honors bold prayers and bold prayers honor God. It's time to start asking him to send us the lost to send us the hurting, to send us the broken, to send us the prodigals, but I wanna take it a step further. It's time for us to start asking God to send us to the hurting, to the broken, to the prodigals. It's time to start praying bold, specific prayers about our city and the lost people in it. The next is God is calling us to be bold in our commitment to his kingdom. The Bible says that the men of Issachar had more than an understanding of the times. They knew what the people should do. What counsel would they give us today? What would they tell us to do? I think they would tell us to follow the example that they set. Let's revisit the story one more time. This was an extremely uncertain time. We know that God was going to remove Saul and the entire kingdom was going to unite underneath of David. And we know that it's all going to work out in the end and the people that stood with the underdog were going to be rewarded for the risks that they took. But they didn't know any of that. See, we get the privilege of reading that thousands of years later, but they didn't know that this was all going to work out the way that it did. See, if they got this decision wrong, stay with me, if they got this decision wrong, they were gonna die. See, Saul was neither merciful nor was he forgiving. So it would have been very tempting for them to sit on the fence for a while and see how things turned out. To stay neutral for as long as possible. To avoid commitment until a clear winner emerged. But the men of Issachar refused to play sides. They went all in with the man of God. They went all in with David. They not only came themselves, but they brought their relatives with them. They tied the fate of their entire family to what God was going to do through David. They took decisive action in a very indecisive season. And that is exactly what we plan to do. In the last 12 months at Porva, this church, our in-person attendance has grown 40%. Our children's ministry is up. Our youth attendance is up. Our community kids last week almost had a record week in their attendance from those we're picking up from the city. Now get this, over the last 12 months, our Spanish congregation has over doubled. I want you to be prepared for this, that when you see the bathroom sign over in this building soon, it's probably gonna say restroom and baño because they're not gonna be able to fit over there. They're gonna have to come over here. 
They're going to fill this building up maybe faster than we do if we don't get our act together. Listen, I prophesy to you today that some of you will step into a lifestyle of boldness and it will propel this congregation into a new wave of revival. In the 2000 or two to 2200, Pickens Road will no longer be able to hold us. We will need another campus on the West End. We will need a campus in Petersburg. We will need a campus down west on Hall Street. We will need a campus downtown Richmond. This property will not hold us. I prophesy that in the name of Jesus Christ. We are seeing the growth. We are seeing the laborers gather together and we are ready to boldly prepare for the first phase of expansion for the future of this church. So starting tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we will begin the demolition and the remodel and the expansion of our current sanctuary. Over the next several months, this place will be transformed from corner to corner. We will update the lighting, our platform, our sound system, our baptistry, our carpet, our seating. But here's the main event. We will be adding capacity for 150 more seats. That's 150 more of your neighbors. That's 150 more of your coworkers. That's more of your family. That's more of your friends. That's for the person you never met. That's for the person driving by right now on 150. Tomorrow night, I'm going to give as many details about this as I can. But I can't do it all right now. We're going to tell you all about how we're going to continue to have church right here during construction. We got it worked out. But we came prepared today to make some kingdom commitments. And we're going to ask you to join us in that by putting my last sermon point into action. You may be seated. Here it is. God is calling us to be bold in our giving. Increasing our seating capacity so that we can minister to more people comes at a cost. Upgrading some of our systems that are in badly need of it, launching more Porva campuses around the Richmond area as we plan to do, all of that comes at a cost. Anything we plan to do that is bigger and better and more bold than we're doing right now is gonna come at a cost. But we believe that the cost of not doing those things is much higher. We believe the cost of complacency is higher than the cost of advancement. We believe the cost of indifference is higher than the cost of expansion. We believe the cost of settling is higher than the cost of increasing. God didn't place Porva here so that we can exist. He placed us here to excel to advance, to take new territory, to grow, to reach your family, your friends, and your coworkers. We've been given an incredible opportunity and God is watching to see how we steward it. Rather than simply hanging on to what we have, he wants us to have a boldness, the boldness that's required to step into the unknown and believe him for more. He's going to bless the people that do. I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you under the unction of the Holy Ghost. God is looking in this room right now. He's looking for people he can trust. I'm telling you, he's looking for people that he can trust with the blessing he has planned for you. I cannot stand prosperity preaching. I can't stand watching the internet preachers and the TV preachers going on about blessing, blessing, blessing all day long. That drives me nuts. But the truth is, God still wants to bless you. That isn't all we preach here because we preach about the other stuff too. But I'm going to tell you something. If he was here today, this is what he would tell you. I'm looking for people that I can take to the next level in blessing. But I have to learn to trust them. I have to know that they can handle that job. I have to know that they will handle that windfall. I have to know that they can be trusted with what I plan to give them. Part of that is simply because we are his kids and he wants to to be good to us. But there's more to that. Blessing his people is one of the primary ways that he provides 
for the revival that he has planned. So if you'll give to the kingdom of God, he will give to you. I've seen it happen more times than I can count. If you'll build a habit of faithfully pray, paying your tithes and offerings, God will increase what you earn. But rather than just a vessel that gets poured into, God is looking for conduits that he can pour finances through. Here's Luke 6 and 38. You've heard it so many times, but I want to read something specific out of it. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, pushed down, shaken together, making sure there's plenty of room in there, running over. Listen, shall men give into your bosom. Give to God and people will give to you. So that you can be blessed, you must give God more so that his kingdom might come and his will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what's the primary vehicle that God uses to accomplish his will on this earth? It's his church. And I want to help build your faith today in two specific areas. I want to build your faith in what you believe God will do for Porva and through Porva. And I want to build your faith into what you believe God will do for you. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, God has commanded you to return his tithes and give an offering. He says to do it, okay? The first two sections of your commitment card are directly out of the Bible, and they apply to all of us. You can find it now if you have it. But that last section... That last section, the sacrificial seed offering that we're asking that you give within the next 60 days, raise your hand if you need a card, is not a biblical mandate. It is an opportunity to be bold. I'm gonna make sure you're paying attention, you get this part here. The last section of the sacrificial seed offering that's to be given in the next 60 days, this is not a mandate, it's not a requirement. This is you saying, God, I'm not doing what I'm not giving you back what already belongs to you. That's my tithes. This is where I'm saying I'm going to do something bold out of the ordinary. I'm going to say, God, you can trust me. This is a chance to make a statement of faith. It's a chance to sow into what God is doing here and reap the rewards that the Bible promises to you when you do. We don't need to pray about whether we should give our tithes and offerings. We don't, we, we, we do that. We, we do that because we either do that or we disobey. But we absolutely pray about what kind of commitment God wants us to make to this church that we call home in the ways of sacrifice. I believe we have the faith and the finances in this room to cover a lot of the cost of the project coming up. But I told the ministers in this room today, this morning, I'm not concerned today. This whole thing wasn't about raising the funds. This sermon today was not about raising the funds for this project. Before God in this room yesterday as I was praying and I began to hear his voice, he says, I'm going to take care of that. That's going to be taken care of. The people will hear my voice and they will, they will make the sacrifices. I'm not concerned about that. What I am concerned about is us learning to break out of that box of timidity to break out of that box of the way we used to give, the way we used to walk, the way we used to talk, and start moving into boldness, start moving into an absolute courage that is strengthened by God and watching Him do things through us that we've never experienced before because we finally said, God, I trust you. I trust you. Why is it and we, we hesitate when it comes to these times of giving back to God. Why? Let's be real. Why is it that we don't go nuts with it? It's because, oh God, I mean, I know you own the cattle on a thousand hills and you hold the world in your hand, but I don't know, it's my money. I mean, being real. I talked to my wife, I said, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make this work? And I'm like, uh, you know, here's the number that I'm feeling and we're talking about it. We don't know what was 60 days. Thank God it's 60 days for us. If it was today, we'd be, I'd be like, I don't know what we're gonna do. But 60 days, we're gonna make it work. We're gonna make the sacrifices necessary to make it happen because I know I can trust God that it's gonna come back many times over. But more than that, it's going to a cause that's going to help change eternity for certain people. I want our church family to be blessed. 
I want to see it to where somebody that's been struggling to get a new job, all of a sudden I hear, I see them come in, they say, I got that job. I want to see that someone's been struggling with a clunker. The car's been struggling. I mean, it's just, well, man, it's about time. They come in and they say, hey, listen, I, I didn't just go out and pay, pay top dollar for whatever else and I'm struggling to make the payments. No, I'm believing God's going to bless you with cars. I'm blessing God's going to bless you with a refinance on your house. God's going to bless you with a new home. He's going to take care of those things. But honestly, much, much of that is secondary to the true kingdom cause that God has planned for this church, that if we can invest in it, it will change the course of history for families like it has for many of you here. I, God is speaking to someone here today that I'm telling you this, I know it. God is speaking $25,000 to some of you, some of you, some of you more. Some of you, God is speaking $10,000 within the next 60 days. You said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. I've already had somebody come up to me and said, listen, God spoke that to me. I'm going to do way more than I've ever done. I'm doing five figures, and it's the first time I've done that, but I know God's going to take care of it, and he's going to do it. Somebody else said, I, 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 listen, I'm giving more than I've ever gone, done. I don't know how I'm going to do it. This is before this service even started. I'm telling you, in this service today, somebody, it has nothing to do with us raising an offering. It has everything to do with us learning how to trust God. Learning how to trust Him. I'm asking to, we're going to pray. And while after I pray, I'm going to ask that you would listen to the voice of God. Let me be real with you. All those are online. There should be something coming up on the screen that's going to give you the directions where to give. And I think it's just poorva.church slash give. But let me tell you, if it's easy, it's probably not boldness. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, really though, is that take a whole lot of boldness for take the $10 bill out of my wallet? You know what I mean? Like, oh man, well, I'm being bold today, you know? Yeah, if it's the last 10 we have and we're not gonna be able to eat this week, that's boldness. So that's equal giving, equal sacrifice. But I'm talking majority of the people in this room. It's not boldness unless it hurts a little bit. It's not faith if I can see exactly where it's coming from and how easy it's gonna be. Peter, how, how you know, you have step of faith you did out of the boat. That wasn't step of faith if he's looking at it and he's like, oh, wow, there's like these little, you know, cinder block stepping stones right outside of the boat here. You know what I mean? That was on faith. That was him looking and saw an easy, easy solution. Let's not look at just easy solutions. Let's look at the fact that, God, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I trust you. I believe in you. Let's pray together. Jesus, you've talked to us during this service. I don't know that there's anything more apostolic than us learning to trust you. I don't know that there's anything more Christian than us learning to say, God, I, I trust you. I believe in you. I know that you're going to take care of it. I know that you're going to do and provide when I don't see a way that you're going to be able to do it. I don't see an answer, God, right in front of me. But I know that if I take the step of faith today, that you're going to provide. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, for every number that's put on that page, that, that card today, that represents, that represents a blessing for this church and the ministry and what we're going to be doing to reach other people, but it also represents new jobs. It represents new financial blessing. It represents that house that they've been looking for. It represents a windfall. It represents something coming back from taxes that they never expected before. It represents a blessing from God. God, speak to your people. Let us move until it hurts. Let us move until it doesn't feel too comfortable. And then we will know that we are walking in faith. Thank you for what you're doing today. And thank you, God, for us hearing your voice. In Jesus' name.